Welcome to this week's RV Podcast, episode 419. And in this episode, we talk about storing your RV for the winter time. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Wendland and this is my lifelong traveling companion and my bride, Jennifer. We're coming to you this week from the beautiful Emerald Coast of Florida's Panhandle. Uh, the end of October as we record this episode, this is a glorious time to be here on the beach. And uh, we've got uh, a conversation that has to do with the winter time. Doesn't feel like winter in October in Florida, but it's coming to most of the country and it's a time when most people put their RVs in storage. And we're going to hear all about that in this episode. We're going to change the format a little bit um, based on some feedback that we've had from many of you who've suggested uh, that we kind of hit the main topic first and then we'll pick up the news of the week and then your questions and comments. Well this week we are going to continue a conversation that we really began last week with Todd Henson. Todd is the um, uh, certified uh, master RV tech and the director of education for the National RV Training Academy. Last week we talked about winterizing your RV and uh, we asked him to come back this week so we could kind of follow up with once we've got it winterized, it's time to put it in storage. And that's a pretty timely topic, I think. It certainly is. It is that time of year. There's no denying it. We got to do this. And uh, with no further ado, here is Todd Henson. And let's talk about winter storage. Joining us now for our second week of discussions about getting your RV in uh, winterized, which we talked about last week. Now, the second part of that is where do you store and how do you store your RV uh, when you're not using it in the off season for a couple of months? Todd Henson from the National RV Training Academy is back with us. And uh, Todd, uh, thank you thank for you. Uh, uh, agreeing to do two of these back to back for us. We sure appreciate it. Well, we got it winterized I'm, last I'm week. We got a winterized last week, and now we're going to put it away. All um, right. Where do we go from that when we talk about storage? You go south. <laughs> <laughs> Store it in warm weather. Yeah, I like right. that. I mean, I, that was one. That was one method of winterization and storing we didn't talk about, and that's to go south. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you can't do that, all right. So um, first and foremost, I'm I'm from Texas, and so you know <laughs> we went rice and then we store it in our yard. But um, let's go over a lot of the considerations. I mean, we have a large investment sitting, you know, in the uh, cold weather, and the one thing we don't want to do is just simply just you know leave it out there. And uh, in all cases, you know, so let's look at some of the best preferences. So number one is is if it's possible is to store it indoors right? Store it indoors. The worst thing that we can do is leave this out in the field by itself, okay? But I know that in some cases, we've got no option. So how do we protect that investment? If you can't store it indoors, I would recommend storing it even outside of trees, okay? I know some people would say, well, if I sit it next to trees, the problem with that is, is that, you know, most trees, of course, they go into winterization mode as well, and that's when we get a lot of foliage that drops. Um, and then, of course, we get limbs that drop. And guys, most of our roofs are, are either some type of rubber membra uh, membrane or PVC membrane. And they falling objects are not desirable. So I would recommend, you know, storing it in an open air uh, situation. Now, from there, what are some other things that we can do? Okay. Now, we know that these RVs, the tires are just sitting there. Um, there's a couple things that I want to look at. One is, of course, if you can roll them up on, you know, some wooden blocks, especially if it's going to be on concrete, go ahead and roll them up on wooden blocks. The second thing is, is that as the uh, air gets cooler and there's really not much going on, the tires can deflate. So I'm going to ask you to look at that, you know, every once in a while, because we've had several situations, even with FEMA, where we would store these uh, in of course, we had survivors living in them, but the tires would, you know, begin to actually decrease their pressure, right? Release the pressure, however you want to say it, right? And the frame would frown and, you know, our, our survivors couldn't get out of the door because the frame was frowning. So we want to make sure that we're keeping an eye on it. So uh, what we want to do is just uh, make sure 
that you know we're we're checking on this every once in a while, uh, checking the pressure of our tires, but also maintaining for uh, looking around for any signs of rodents, uh, uh, any other type of wild uh, uh, animals, because they're looking for a place that's warm, right? And they will chew their way in uh, and get outside of the uh, uh, cold weather. Now, to me, um, because people ask this all the time, how can we prevent you know mice? And if I could come up with a surefire way, I would be a gazillionaire, I think. Um, we're on their property. We're on their turf, right? Most of us, we're on their turf. Um, the best that we can do is to, you know, do <laughs> whatever we can to try and stop them. But, you know, all we can do is maybe limit what happens. Um, I have heard of lights. I've heard of putting soap down. Um, and while, some, you know, there is some... Um, I, I guess uh, good effects from that I've seen where it, it doesn't matter, right? So the best thing that we could do is keep our eyes on it and try and mitigate it as much as possible. Honestly, um, having a good uh, feral cat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's what best. I recommend is get a cat. And and there are so many different ways, and they all everybody has a theory. We'll put links to those uh, along with this in the show notes right. to this thing. Uh, but checking wow. it regularly. Uh, so we we have it stored. A, a big question that I get all the time is, uh, particularly those in really cold climates where they get a lot of snow, is yeah. should they put a cover over the RV? Right. I um, well, and to me, I'm gonna I'm gonna say, you know, um, I would like for it to be covered simply because um, UV damage. Right. If I have it covered, I don't get the UV damage that's going on top of that roof because now I've got something at least blocking it or blocking much of it. But I also know that that also causes, you know, some potential problems. We can get um, rain up under there. We can get not rain. I'm sorry. We can get air up under there if it's not set right. We get puddles um, because, of course, now we're putting a fabric up there. And sometimes when it rains, you know, it'll puddle. And now I've got water puddling. Whereas if I didn't have a cover, there wouldn't be a puddle factor, right? So while there's some benefits to it, there's also a lot of considerations. And, um, you know, having that puddle of water sitting up there, you know, it isn't terrible until it freezes. And now we've got a frozen block up there and it's just going to rip um, that. So it, where, where one... We're saving something to, we, you know, there's just more consideration. So I'm going to say... Uh, on that as well, uh, that is a preference uh, matter when it comes to that. I like the idea of not putting UV damage up there on the roof because that's where the most expensive parts are. Yeah. The the other thing with covers that I hear all the time is uh, people have had really bad experience. They they buy a this cover. A good cover is expensive. You know, it's 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 got to be uh, uh, water resistant, but it also has to be breathable. And they're just buying right. these blue tarps at the big box stores, and that is oh no, yeah. So, so I, I I'm glad to hear yeah, you say that. I, I didn't imagine saying, that whenever you asked the question. Uh, I've been saying that don't you don't need one, <laughs> but uh, that's good. Right. There's a big cover no, industry, yeah. and they get mad at me when I say that, but I, I I'm glad to hear that. What about the uh, so so we get it on, on wooden block? We get this tires on wood if it's outside. Um, you know, we're going in looking for mice damage and all of that stuff. What about the batteries? This is another one. Uh, should people triple yes. charge the batteries? Should they remove the batteries, uh, turn them off? Should they keep it plugged in if they have a hookup? What kind of things should they do when their RVs in stories are not being used? All those answers, all those answers were yes. <laughs> oh, good. That okay. was it. <laughs> Yeah, so a, a lead acid gel or AGM battery is going to self-discharge its voltage, roughly one volt every 30 days. So the best thing that we can do is keep it, you know, on charge. If you have access uh, to uh, run power out to your RV, the simplest thing you can do is just simply plug it in. It doesn't, it does, it doesn't have to be the full um, amperage. In other words, if you have a 50 amp RV, you don't have to plug it into 50 amps providing that you don't turn anything else on because the generate i'm sorry the uh converter that we have or the battery charger in the rv is a maintenance or a maintainer a battery maintainer it's sometimes called a trickle charge so the best thing that we can do is keep those batteries charged up the best way to explain it is you know whatever your favorite you know frozen drink is where you're you're 
mixing your ice and your your liquid of choice, adult beverage, whatever, right? And then you add whatever you know flavoring you have. You stick it in a blender, right? So you get it all blended up. Well, it'll stay blended for a little bit, but after a time, when you turn that blender off, things begin to separate, and that's what's going on inside the batteries. Uh, because they have electrolytes in there, kind of a salt. If we don't use them, the salt's going to basically stratify and sit down because we're not keeping it charged. We're not keeping the blender on. So if you have power to it, yeah, go ahead and connect it to power. If you don't have power, yes, if you can remove the batteries, bring it to your home location and put a, a battery maintainer, put it on a battery maintainer, that would be great. What about um, lithium batteries? Lithium battery, any they, they supposedly are maintenance free. Is that true? Yes, that is true. They have no. very little. Uh, they have very little uh, electrolyte in them, and they don't off gas, so they are maintenance free. There's not much we have to do. Hallelujah. Um, I know a lot of people will say, "Hey, Todd, I do know that lithium." You know, the consideration is, of course, when it gets really cold. Well, when it gets really cold, we don't want to charge them. So lithium batteries, when we get right around the freezing point, that's when lithium batteries, the consideration is, is not to charge them heavily. So um, if you are winterizing and you don't have anything else on, even with a lithium battery, you can leave it there um, in the RV with a small maintainer charge because it's going to drop it down to five amps anyway to charge it. So you're fine there. If you want to take those back to um, your uh, home place of residence or whatnot, you can just simply set those and let them set. Um, Most manufacturers will say up to six months. You don't have to charge them back up. It's ideal to keep them on a charge, but lithium is a different chemistry altogether. You, You don't have to keep them on a charge. Then the question about uh, everybody seems to be getting solar panels. Uh, what concerns about those? What if snow can can they handle snow on top of them? They're obviously not going to be very effective in charging. But uh, do we have right. to do anything special with our with our solar panels when the RVs in storage? Oh, so most solar panels. Well, one, they're going to have a longer warranty on the solar panel than on your roof. <laughs> so your roof <laughs> is supposedly ten years. Come on, uh, best at two. Um, but solar panels are good for about 25 years. Uh, depending on you know which ones you buy, they'll have even a rating for hail. And I tell you, I'd much rather have a, a hail damage to a solar panel than on my RV. Solar panels are a heck of a lot cheaper to replace. Um, they can handle snow, right? Um, definitely can handle snow. The consideration is, is when you um, come back to dewinterizers, you may want to get up there and clean them. They won't be very efficient. In other words, if it's a 200-watt panel that you have, and if it's all dirty, you may only see 60 or 70 watts. So we got to get up there and clean them just like you would, say, your um, windshield. Um, and really one of the best things after you clean it, you know, just with regular Windex or whatnot, come back with some, you know, some, uh, what is that, rain X or something like that, where it gives a very thin film, um, wax film. So that way when the water hits, it rolls off. So well, treat it just have- like you would your windshield. I I think the most valuable advice you gave is um, go south <laughs> until yes. it's warmed up. Right? So after that, it was all downhill. <laughs> it was all downhill. Well, we have now winterized our RV. We now know what to do with it and keeping it in storage. And uh, uh, two more great interviews uh, racked up with Todd Henson from the National RV Training Academy. Uh, Todd, uh, we want to give another pitch for the uh, course that you guys make. It's it's really one of the finest courses I've ever seen that teaches us all how to maintain our RVs. Now, I know a lot of people just go have their RVs winterized at a, at a dealer, and that's the easy way to do it. But um, j- as we wrap all this, uh, just the importance of people being able to do their own maintenance. Uh, would you yeah. just address that a little bit, that it's not that complicated. Even I can do some of it. <laughs> so talk about why we need to know that. Yeah. And I think what happens is we, we get deflated. We go in, you know, brand new, the RV lifestyle. We think, well, we've worked on homes. We've, we've done some stuff in the house. RV is not going to be that much different. And it's a lot of nuance, right? There's things that just don't operate the same as it does in the house. And because of those little nuances, a lot of us, you know, we just totally don't know what to do, you know, with the RV. 
And so, you know, having this course, our, you know, the course that we uh, put together was to help you pass all of those nuances because most of the stuff, once it's fully explained, you're like, I got this, you know, this is now not that hard. And that's, that's our whole goal is to make the RV lifestyle, you know, the RVers achieve what they're really, you know, what their goal is. And that's to, you know, go experience life, not to worry about why isn't this working or what do I need to do here? That's a lot of stress that you don't need. And it's not because, you know, you're, you're not smart enough. It's just simply because it hasn't been explained to you. So that's what we're actually covering in that home study course. Well, we will, we will suggest that and put some links to it and uh, we'll have you back in a couple of months. We'll be having you back uh, how to get our RV out of winterization and uh, how to uh, get it out of storage. So Todd Henson, Great. thank you so much for making the time with us today. Thank you for having me. Well, if you enjoy Todd's instructions, he makes available a home study course that teaches you how to maintain and service your RV. And uh, it's a great resource, one that we recommend. Uh, we'll put a link on the screen and uh, for those of you watching on YouTube and in the show notes that you'll find at rvlifestyle.com. Uh, when we come back in a minute, we're going to talk about uh, the RV news of the week and we want to urge you to stick around to the questions time because we're going to talk about putting an RV in, in storage and then what do you do about the tires and that will be an interesting discussion uh, a little bit later on in the podcast. Right now, let's take a quick break and come back then with your comments and questions. Tired of overcrowded campgrounds and competing for reservations, paying high fees for sites? Well, ownership is an emerging trend in RVing that might be right for you. It was for Jen and me. We bought some land just west of Nashville, Tennessee in an incredible collection of mountaintop RV properties called the Woodlands at Buffalo River. These are five to 62 acre properties that allow RVs year round starting at $79,900. And we loved it. The scenery is breathtaking and you can own it outright. It's not a timeshare, it's your property, your way. You can landscape, garden, bring your pets, build what you want to. There's high speed internet and it's so private. It's a great place to make your home base. No more calling around for reservations, ready whenever you want. And they're selling these properties by appointment, five to 62 acres, $79,900. Financing, big discounts available on multi-lot packages. For information, visit myrvland.com, myrvland.com. When we're asked what's the most important modification we made to our RV, it's an easy answer. Battleborn batteries. Battleborn batteries are quality, safe, reliable lithium batteries that allow us to stay out there off the grid longer. Lithium batteries charge faster, they charge fuller, they're longer lasting, they're maintenance free, and battleborn batteries are protected by a 10 year guarantee. Now, in our case, they just dropped into the existing AGM batteries that we have, and they'll probably be the same on your rig too. Battleborn battery experts can get those in your rig just like they did with ours. They can also match you up with the right cabling, the inverter, the charger, the solar controller, everything. Jennifer and I swear by our Battleborn batteries. They allow us to boondock off the grid. Check them out. Go to rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. Welcome back, and now it's time for the RV news of the week. You know, and I hate to have us be known as the bad news uh, bearers, <laughs> bearers, get it? Um, but um, we kind of are. Uh, we've got lots of bad news to share, a couple of stories at least. Uh, the, the first is of a looming crisis. Diesel supplies in the U.S. are at their lowest levels now since 1993. And this is causing a lot of worry uh, among all of the experts for a lot of reasons. It's causing a lot of concern in the RV world because uh, many of us have diesel-powered tow vehicles uh, or diesel-powered motorhomes. And uh, the U.S. now has only a 20 five day supply of diesel fuel and um, that's the lowest it's been in, in a long time uh, in the northeast this is the time of year many people are stocking up with diesel oil which they use to heat their house we're coming up to the christmas shopping season yeah this time of year normally we need more fuel we, we need more fuel we've got trucks on the road delivering uh, supplies 
everybody's still trying to uh, to catch up with the uh, with the uh, supply chain issues that are out there. The trucks are are just working as hard as they can. They are all fueled by diesel. So are uh, railroad cars, uh, railroad uh, engines are almost all diesel these days, and uh, it's 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 crazy out there. Um, so there's a lot of concern going into the winter, and there's a lot of reasons for this. Mostly their reasons are being blamed on some rather complicated market training trading practices, um, and if I can simplify it greatly, it means that traders uh, will pay more for prop deliveries rather than worrying about a future delivery in which right now the trend is that diesel prices are going up so uh, they're ordering as much as they can right now that's reducing the supply and uh, they uh, they figure that they're going to save money because uh, the betting is all that diesel prices are going to be very high just like fuel prices are going up and up and up. Well that makes a lot of sense it does. to try to get it right now before it goes up anymore because it's going up so crazy. But it's cutting down those reserves and then adding to that is uh, uh, there's a, been a steady decline on the East Coast of refining capacity over the last several years. Uh, that has made that area particularly reliant on overseas sources uh, and that usually comes across the Atlantic from Europe and Russia and the Ukraine war as you know has uh, put a stop to that. So it's pretty grim for uh, the trucking industry and of course the RVers of uh, RV industry and RVers who run with diesel are watching this very closely. So uh, uh, it's, it's frightening. We'll have a question about that from one of our readers who's worried about fuel, uh, not just diesel but gas as well. But this is a big issue. It and is a big issue. A lot more. Yeah. What and else? Uh, well, the next story, have you ever been out there taking a hike and you know you run across all those piles, people pile stone upon stone and I don't know how you feel about that, but in Texas, they have uh, the state park officials are asking people to please stop doing that. When you pile up all those stones, you're ruining the natural habitat for uh, a lot of little creatures that uh, live underneath those stones. You're just messing up nature and a lot of these little creatures that become vulnerable to predators so stop doing that texas is saying please don't do that and i think we've heard about this from other states too yeah there's other states that are um, saying asking you to do this stop doing this i don't know why this craze started i guess people somehow want to be significant and pile stones on top of each other I guess you're either in one camp or the other. You either like that and you do those piles of stones or else you're like me and think, leave it the way you found it. The whole thing with camping is leave no trace that you were there. And that violates that right yes. off the top. That yeah. violates that. So I'm not a big fan of uh, piling stones up on so, one on top of another. So Texas state officials now saying... Thank you, Texas. Don't do that. Other states saying the same thing. But Texas being very vocal about it these days. And speaking of Texas, uh, a woman there this past week was gored by uh, a bison. This happened at Cap Rock Canyon State Park in Texas last week. Uh, she actually posted a video of the whole thing on okay, social... Okay, now who was uh, videoing this? Uh, somebody else was taking it, obviously, because she, uh, she was trying to pass this bison slowly on foot. She got too close, the bison charged her, and it literally tossed her up into a thorny bush. Um, she was able to call for help. A helicopter had to come and take her to a hospital. Uh, she had a three inch puncture wound in her back. Uh, authorities of course recommend that people stay at least 50 yards away from bison. Uh, people constantly violate that and they're being tossed and bored. Um, we'll put a link to a story about that in the show notes, but um, you know, stay away from bison. I just don't understand this. It's hard for me to figure it out. But we've got uh, another story here. This is a sad story of Michigan. There was a 40-year-old Missouri man who uh, died while camping from carbon monoxide. And it's good, that reminder for all of us, make sure that your heater is working properly. Don't just presume, and have that monitor to let you know if you're in a bad situation. So this 40-year-old man from Missouri and his two dogs they both died. And this happened at a campground in uh, Ingham County, uh, near the uh, capital of Lansing in Michigan last week. Um, we were 
camping with all of our uh, RV lifestyle fans and supporters last week in Tennessee and that cold snap came through and everybody's propane was on and you always worry about that at the start of the season. Mm -hmm. uh, now our folks all did a really good job. They all checked their propane but um, lots of people don't use it much during the summer. It's important that you check it regularly. Uh, we hear about carbon monoxide because of faulty propane. We hear about fires because of it. Uh, we know that bees, hornets, love to make nests. They love the Spiders. smell of it. Spiders do. You, you really need, even if it's a new RV, check it regularly. Just right. open that little propane area up and make sure that there's no gunk in there. Um, Propane, carbon monoxide, fire dangers, they're always present when you use propane. Now, that's not saying propane's dangerous, it isn't, but it is dangerous not to have it well maintained. How's that? Yes. All right. Uh, all right, we've got some comments and some questions for that when we come back. When we're on a road trip, we always seem to find a way to stop at a Camping World Center. There are over 225 Camping World locations across the country, and there's always one close by when we need parts and accessories for our RV or just want to shop. In fact, uh, we have so much fun with uh, Camping World, and as we talk about it as one of our sponsors, they have agreed to offer a 10% discount if you use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10 when you buy $99 or more in merchandise. You'll find everything you want from outdoor furniture and appliances, the ones you see us use in our videos and that we talk about here in the podcast. RV extras that include everything from camping chairs to fire pits, electrical accessories, must-have gadgets. Check them all out. And again, don't forget, use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10 when you visit CampingWorld.com. Welcome back, everybody. Now time for reader feedback and your RV questions of the week. Okay, so our first feedback comes from Raymond from Big Sky Country of Montana. Good morning and happy RVing. Recently, the question was asked about keeping eggs from cracking while camping. Here is my tip. We've been doing this for at least 30 years. We crack our eggs open and put them into a container and then place them in the refrigerator or into a cooler. We have even done multiple containers depending on our meal plan. A full dozen for the breakfast casserole, three eggs in a container for a cake in the Dutch oven. Hope this helps. It sure works for us. And Raymond, thank you for saying that you love our podcast. So I have never thought of that. So you just crack the eggs and put it in a container? Yeah, when I first read this, I thought, how do you separate them? Kind of guess at how, how much the egg white, the egg yolks are kind of easy to tell. But it Maybe makes you sense. Just stir it if all you're, together? No. If you're going to make like a cake and you need two or three eggs, you'd put that in one container. And like you said, for a breakfast casserole where you need a dozen eggs, you'd crack those and put those in another container. So you'd, you'd have a few containers with eggs in. Well, there you go. Uh, thank you, you Randy. Don't have to worry about them cracking on the road. And we love getting your comments uh, on anything you heard today, and we love getting your questions. And the best way to reach us is through our personal email, which is Mike and Jen at RVLifestyle.com. All right, we've got a couple of questions that we want to do. You want to do the first question? All right, first question. Uh, we are looking into purchasing a van, but worried if uh, gas will disappear. How do you feel about this? We are 68, and we have one chance for a van. My husband has some health problems and we want to enjoy camping while we can, but worried spending all this money and not having any gas available. What do you think as to gas availability during the next five years? That's a tough question because nobody knows the future. Nobody knows what tomorrow will bring. I can't believe that we wouldn't have gas. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it might be pricey. As much as we talk about uh, electric vehicles, uh, and they are awesome, um, they really are. But you know, we're not ready yet to get away to do away with gas. I don't know what they're going to do in California. That's California. But uh, I don't see gas being unavailable. Uh, you know, a lot of it is depending on uh, who's in charge, <laughs> the government. No matter what I say, I will be attacked by either the right or the left. Uh, one will blame it all on Trump, the other will blame it all on Biden, but the fact of the matter is, is uh, gas prices are incredibly high now. It looks like they're going to continue to be high. As we reported earlier, diesel prices 
are high and there's that potential diesel shortage. All that's to say, we still are planning to do a lot of RV traveling and we don't foresee a time when gas will be unavailable. It will be expensive, but I guess my best advice that I would say is, uh, you know, this is your shot. You know, you have been working for this. Get your van. Uh, they're looking for a Class B van and uh, go out there and enjoy it as best you can. I think that there will always be gas available. But the country has to have it. They have to have it. They can't survive without it. There will always be a reason not to do something. And you're saying that you're 68 years old and your husband has some health issues. So if you're going to do it, I'd say you better get doing it because, yeah. like you say, this might be your last chance if you live cautiously. I, I mean, I heard a know. lot of people say the same thing during COVID, you know, yeah. they, everybody lost a year. So almost everybody, we, we continued to travel, but um, not as much, uh, but it was a lost year. And then I heard people last year say, well, we're going to not go anywhere this year either. I don't have another year to lose, so I'm going to keep traveling. And if gas prices get high, I'll try and cut back elsewhere. One of the reasons we bought land, our own land in uh, Tennessee and now in Michigan, is so we always have a place to go and it's not necessarily across the country if gas prices get prohibitively high, but we have a place that we can go and camp. I think there's lots of ways that we'll be able to get around all this stuff and still be able to enjoy the RV. We just have to adjust, so um, go and get you, it. And you never know. You know, you, your husband, I don't know what's going on, but you just never know, and you got to take a chance. You do. Uh, all right, another question that came in. Um, this is from Jeff, and he says, we're going to be putting a fifth wheel on a permanent cement campsite by our daughter's house in South Georgia. On the fifth wheel, once on the permanent site, we do not plan on moving that camper for one or two years. So I need to know, should we raise the fifth wheel so the tires are off the ground and then cover them to take better care of them? I will be blocking up the camper on all four corners and the middle of the camper uh, where the structure will allow it to be the most stable. If the tires wear and tear is a problem, uh, uh, we, we would, would want to move it one or two years down the road, but we want to make sure it's okay until then. Your thoughts and insight would be appreciated. It's a topic others may not have thought of, but with all the talk about owning your own property, and keeping your RV on site, we think it's a good question to ask. So what's best for camper and tires, especially if it's on a concrete pad? I think that is an excellent question. People are always asking us about leaving their vehicle. What about those tires? You know, it's like, Wow, it's like almost everything these days. No matter what I say, I'm opening a can of worms because there's, everybody has their own pet theory. But I'll give you mine because you asked for mine. And uh, uh, one thing I think you're going to do, you're talking about supporting it on four corners, and that would be with uh, jack stands. I'm assuming that's what you're talking about. Uh, instead of relying strictly on your leveling jacks, that's important. Uh, your leveling jacks, you can put them down, and what you would do. Uh, without overly complicating is you'd make them up high so the wheels are just barely off the ground, put the jack stands near the wheels on the frame, then bring those hydraulic uh, levelers down so they're still down giving support but not all of it. Um, other people will um, go through about every 30 days and they will um, rotate the tires. They'll get them, they'll kick them up a little bit so they can do it and then they'll rotate them. Um, the reason why is they don't want to have, a, have it, what they call flat topped, where there's a flat indentation in the tire from sitting too long. I'm told by many others that usually that flat top uh, resolves itself as you drive down a little bit and the air inside starts circulating. Uh, check the pressure on your tires, make sure they're always at the adjusted cold setting for them. You want to get the tires off the cement, the hot cement, particularly in South Georgia. It gets it's very, be hot. very hot. Um, simplest thing is put them on a thin piece of plywood or those flat little uh, Lego blocks that you can get. Put the tires on those. Uh, I would not take all of the weight off the tires, but I would take uh, so the tires are not supporting all of it. Um, some people like these, uh, I don't know if you've seen them, these uh, Anderson levelers. They're kind of like a curved thing. And you could put your RV on that and then put the levelers down, then put your jacks on it. Um, what other things? Um, 
I think the the big thing is uh, uh, if you're going to leave it there for a long time, putting the putting it on those those jacks, those uh, those leveling jacks, not the leveling levelers, the automatic levelers, but leveling jacks, and uh, rotating it, getting it up every. Some people do it every 30 days. Some people do it every 180 days. But just rotate the tire so it's not sitting in one spot. Uh, there's controversy over that. Some people say the flat tops, as I said, will disappear. But uh, why not do it right? And one last thing: cover those tires uh, to protect them from UV damage. You can get tire covers at any RV store. Camping World has them, and uh, other other uh, big general RV stores have them. And you can find those uh, tire covers. So. So that's that. We're going to actually talk in a in a future episode, just a, a week or two. We'll 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 talk a whole bunch more about tires. We've been getting a lot of questions about tires, things like China bombs, those tires that are uh, kind of uh, entry level tires that many RV makers put on their RVs. They're made in China. There's been a lot of anecdotal reports of problems with them. Uh, we'll report all of that. You hear a lot of noise in the background. We're at a uh, at the. On the water, this is the, the sound between Chattahatchee Bay, Chattahatchee Bay, the Gulf of Mexico, and we're at the uh, Adventure Marine docks here uh, in, um, in Florida as we record this. So those are our questions. We would love to get your questions and your comments. Again, our email is Mike and Jen at RVLifestyle.com. So um, I feel a little guilty being in this beautiful weather and talking about winterizing and all those folks back north as November approaches now, uh, worried about cold and winterizing. Well, I think they're having some pretty beautiful weather up north too. And it's fall, it's beautiful in it, the north. It is, it is. Um, so we're um, delighted to be with you from Florida. I think we're gonna go enjoy the sun and another spectacular sunset. I do like rubbing it in. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you in bad weather. Uh, please let us hear from you, your comments, your questions. Uh, you can catch this, a transcript of our interview with Todd and uh, all the information we shared in the show notes for this episode at rvlifestyle.com. Till next week, we'll see you down the road. Happy trails.